<laughs> Abba, Father, in Christ's name, in your Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this new month, this springtime. Lord, we just look forward to all that you're doing, new beginnings, new life, fresh starts. Holy Spirit, we ask that you be our rabbi today in teaching us from the living word. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and courage, and hearts to obey. We thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, today is April 1st. It's a new day, new month in the Gregorian, the Roman calendar. Uh, but we're going to talk about the new Hebrew month that begins tomorrow. And it's called the New Year for Kings and Festivals among the Jews. So let's just get into it. Interestingly, if you were to ask someone, what is the first commandment, uh, probably everyone would go to Exodus 20 and begin quoting from the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And that would not be wrong from that standpoint, from the Sinai uh, word that God gave. But the actual first commandment to God's people as a whole, as a nation, is found earlier than that. And we see it in Exodus 12, 1 through 2. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month, which is Aviv Nisan, shall be for you the beginning of the months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Now, this is called the Rosh Kodesh in Hebrew. Rosh is beginning. It's from the root to shake and like to shake the head. And so it literally or figuratively means beginning, captain, chief, forefront, principal, ruler, or top. And Kodesh, months, is a new moon, and by implication, it means the first day of the lunar month. So this is important, and we're going to see this, but the very first mitzvah, which is Hebrew for commandment, the first mitzvah given to the newly born nation of Israel had to do with establishing Nisan as the Rosh Kodesh, which is the head of the beginning of the months. Thus, this was the very first new moon ever counted by God's people. So the very first commandment that God ever gave to his people as a whole was this, to establish this month as the first month, and Nisan 1 is the first day. We're going to see why that's so important. Well, the word Nisan comes from an Assyrian root, and it literally means beginning, but it was originally called Aviv. Sometimes we transliterate it in English as Abib with B's, but the bait, but it actually is pronounced with the V sound, Aviv. And it was originally named that before the exile, but after the exile, it came to be known as Nisan. So this Hebrew month coincides with the Roman calendar months of March and April. Remember, our Roman calendar is a solar calendar, and the Hebrew calendar is a lunar calendar. And so that's why there's a variance there. Uh, it doesn't always fall. It doesn't always equally coincide. But it was during this first Hebrew month of the ecclesiastical year that God ordained the spring holy days. So the new civil year falls on the first of Tishrei, which comes from the Akkadian or Babylonian root, meaning to begin as well. well. And this is the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar, which falls during September or October of the Roman solar calendar. And this first day is Rosh Hashanah, which means head of the year, and it initiates the autumn holy days. And so the Hebrew people have actually four new, new years, but we'll just talk about the two main ones. Uh, the first one is the beginning or the head of months. So the first month of the year is Nisan, which begins tomorrow. So the Lord starts counting months. He starts beginning his ecclesiastical cycle with the spring festivals and the fall festivals in the sun. But in the fall festivals, that's when the new civil year begins. And what that means is the actual year change. Like we have from uh, 2021 into 2022, they would have 5781 into 5782. So the civil year changes in the fall, but the new months begin in the spring. And there's purpose in that. And that's the month of Nisan that we're about to enter. Well, it's a new lunar year, so it's a new move. Now, this is what Abba said in Exodus 13, 4. Today, in the month of Aviv, you're going out. Now, Aviv means tender ear of grain, green, young, or by implication, then, it means to begin. 
So God established that he would lead his people out of bondage during the first month of his ecclesiastical calendar, which is Aviv Nisan. And this speaks of him birthing, beginning something new, something green, something tender on the earth. It speaks of new life. Abba's intentional in everything he does. He's precise. He's brilliant in what he does. So the Hebrew people at this point have no concept of the depth of the meaning of this. Abba is revealing himself uh, step by step, day by day in greater measure. He's revealing his word. He's revealing his commandments, his instruction. But he begins with that very first commandment, set this day, Aviv, Nisan, as the first day of the first months of the year. This means new beginnings. It means fresh life. And I'm going to bring you into a new land. I'm going to begin something new in you. And there's double creation and double redemption. Now, just as a little bit of a side note here, there's a famous debate in the Talmud. And the Talmud for the Hebrew people is effectively a commentary. It's got uh, lots of different writings from various rabbis, from uh, sages, and they're discussing Torah, they're discussing the Word of God. So that's what the Talmud is. And there's a debate that's recorded in there between Rabbi Yehoshua and Rabbi Eliezer. And the former, Yehoshua states that creation began in Nisan, in the spring. But the latter states that it began in Tishrei, in autumn. Now, the fact is, is that Jews accept and celebrate God's creation in Tishrei. They accept it when the, the new year comes, Rosh Hashanah. However, both are correct because there's always two creation events in life, if you think about it. The first comes with the revelation of the creation or conception of an idea or thought. And the second comes with the physical tangible manifestation of that idea. And what I mean by that in just practical terms, that's true for every single one of us. Uh, in one regard, creation begins with an idea. And then there's another creation when it actually becomes tangible reality. Uh, there's several craftsmen and craftswomen in here, woodworkers. Uh, you, you understand what I'm talking about. You conceive something, a chair, a table, a uh, a desk, uh, whatever it may be, you see it in your mind. Okay, that's first creation, but yet it doesn't exist in the natural world yet. It exists in your heart and in your mind, but it doesn't exist. Well, that's really how these two uh, festival seasons play with one another, is that Abba is starting to reveal something in the spring festivals that's in his heart, in his mind, and it comes to fulfillment in the fall, and we're going to touch on that. But so we have double creation going on here. We have the conception of an idea, which is a creation. And then we have the manifestation of it in the natural. That's also creation. So it's from idea to tangible reality. And Genesis 1, 3 through 9 really gives revelation regarding the process for how Jehovah begins his ideas, or bring, excuse me, brings his ideas into fulfillment in the natural, tangible reality. We talked about light, you know, let there be light in Genesis 1-3. That's the illumination or revelation of a conceived idea. And then in verse 6, he spoke of water, and that's the moisture that nurtures life and growth. It's the beginning of tangible reality, though it in its normal state cannot be grasped with the hands. So water is tangible, it's, it's tactile, you can touch it. But at the same time, you can't grasp it. If you were to try, it just goes right through your fingers. Land, in verse 9, that's the solid and tangible natural reality of something God previously imagined. It can now be grasped. So we see from Genesis 1 how God begins to reveal that process of creation. There's something in his heart and his mind that's light, and he reveals that light. And then he speaks to that, and he begins the process of bringing that to a tangible reality. So there are two creations uh, processes in everything that God does in the earth. There's the thing that happens in the heart and the mind first. It starts in the heart and mind of God, and then it becomes a tangible reality in the earth. This, again, let's look at the spring and autumn festivals. In Genesis 1, 3 through 9, that pattern is reflected in Jehovah's ordained spring, autumn feasts and festivals, spring and fall there. God commanded observances in Nisan speak to the purpose and work of Yeshua's first coming to the earth. 
And these are the revelation that he's the light of the world and his work of redemption, as well as the time of outpouring of Holy Spirit, the living water of Holy Spirit. And this birthed and initiated the truth of God's idea of his total kingdom reign over the land. Now think about the process we just talked about. Light, God illumines, he gives revelation to his idea. And that's redemption, that's restoration. And so he begins that in the spring festivals. That's when Christ came the first time. He was birthed into the earth. He revealed himself. He is the light of the world. His work of redemption on the cross, outpouring of Holy Spirit, that's living water. And so there was an experience of Holy Spirit, but at the same time, you know, you can't touch him with your fingers. You can't hold him in your hands in that regard. So there's something that's still that he's doing. And the fall festivals, autumn, speak of the tangible, fulfilled reality of Christ's second coming and him having complete dominion over the earth. I don't think anybody would look around right now and say that Christ's kingdom has complete dominion over the earth. I certainly don't think that. I look at what's happening in our government right now. We look at the, the conflict, the strife in the world. I don't think anybody says that the kingdom of God is ruling fully over all the earth, that God's servant leaders are the ones who are in these positions of leadership over the governments, uh, in the school system, in the media. I don't think anybody would say that. Well, so is the kingdom not here? Yes, it's here because Christ is here, Holy Spirit is here, and he's working. And so we had the fulfillment of the spring festivals in Christ's coming, uh, his being the lamb, the Passover, his resurrection. We see the outpouring of Holy Spirit. All that has already occurred. It's all in place. That's the beginnings of the God's fulfillment, which the autumn festivals point to. That's the second return of Christ when this entire earth is brought under his dominion and rule. So that's what the spring and the fall, the autumn festivals are about. That's what they point to. So it's spirituality into physicality. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not was anything made that was made. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Now, word there is logos. You've heard that word multiple times. But logos is communication of a thought by something that is said, and it includes the reasoning and the motive. So Yeshua, Jesus, is the ultimate reality and divine example of how God moves from a thought or idea into its manifestation in the earth. Now, Christ is God. He's equal with Abba and Holy Spirit. He's always existed. He never has, He has no beginning. But he did have a beginning in the earth physically. He was born in the earth. There it was an actual day when that happened. And John tells us he is the logos of God. He is the manifestation of God. He's the manifestation of the thought of God, the heart of God, the mind of God. He is God. And so Christ said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he's the tangible manifestation of that. And so we see the word became flesh, that's spirituality into physicality. And so we see these types replayed over and over and over again in the word of God. And we're called to join God. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I'm watching over my word to perform it. So God performs his own word. But we see this in James 1, through 25 but be doers of the word, doers of the logos, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now, what's interesting about the word doer there, uh, in English, we say doer, it's poietes in Greek, and it's rooted in the word poet. It's where we get poet, poietes, and it means a performer. By extension, it means a maker, a producer, a doer. So that's a beautiful word, and it's a beautiful thought, because when you start agreeing with God and doing his word, you're a poet for the Lord. 
You're speaking the beauty of his word. You're living the beauty of his word in the earth. Your life becomes poetry when you're agreeing with God. But it has to do with action. It has to do with doing, not just listening, but acting upon. And we can see that where if you have an illumination of an idea, but it doesn't become a tangible reality in your life, James is saying that's worthless. I mean, if all you're going to do is just sit and listen to the word, but you're not going to act on it, it it's not going to be a part of your life. You're not going to be poetically involved in joining God, then it, it's no value to you. Now, let's talk about the month of Nisan as it's revealed in Scripture and all the things that God did and still does in the month of Nisan. So in Exodus 3.20, this is during the month of Nisan. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he, being Pharaoh, will let you go. Now, wonders here is pala, and it's the root in separate. It literally or figuratively means to distinguish, and by implication, it means to make great, wonderful, marvelous, miraculous, things too high for us as humans. So Nisan is the month of expectancy of God's miraculous power to be revealed, to glorify his name, and to bless his people. And Yeshua's public ministry was marked by signs and wonders. So Christ is mirroring this. Holy Spirit is moving through Christ and performing signs and wonders. So again, let's go back. What was the very first mitzvah? What was the very first commandment God ever gave to his people as a whole? It had to do with the month of Nisan and establishing it as the beginning of the months of the year, because God was going to be beginning something new in the earth. And that's exactly what he did. Under Moses' leadership, by the power of God, God was performing signs and wonders and miracles, and he was showing that he is greater than all the gods of Egypt and all that demonic power. And he humiliated each god step by step by all the things that he did. And he proved that he is the ultimate God. He's the one true God in the earth. And that happened in the month of Nisan. So the month of Nisan is a month of miracles. It's also a month of judgment. But the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Again, this is all happening in Nisan. That's Exodus 6, 1. See is ra'ah, and it means to see, to look at, figuratively to inspect, perceive, discern, or consider. So Nisan is the month to see and perceive God's hand of judgment against that which oppresses his people. And that's key. And hang on to that as we move into this new month. Nisan is the month of redemption. Exodus 6.6. 6. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. So Nisan is the month that brought redemption from slavery in Egypt as the type and the shadow of the ultimate redemption from slavery to sin and death through Christ. So that was a literal redemption. They had been literally slaves, physically slaves in Egypt, and God brought redemption from that. And that is a foreshadowing. It's a type for the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. All of us are slaves to sin and death because of our own sin. And Christ is our salvation. He's our Messiah. He's the one who leads us out. And all of that begins in the month of Nisan. It's the month of readiness. Exodus 12, 11. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand and you shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. Now remember this, God does not simply save you from something, but to something else. So in other words, God's redemption always carries his command to be ready to actively move forward to his greater purpose in the freedom he provides. And those who are not willing and ready to move with him at his command will miss the greater blessing he intends to give. Now, remember, Christ didn't come simply to save us from hell. And if that's the message, that's pathetic. That, that is, that's far short of the glory of God. He didn't come to save us from hell. He came to save us to himself. And so if we look at Christ as just a way not to go to hell, that's horrible. What, what an insult to him. And, and what, a, what a terrible theology, because you miss out on the whole purpose. The purpose is to be restored to 
something, more namely someone. So God is not just simply saving his people from slavery in Egypt. He's saving them to himself. He's saving them to their own land, their own nation. He's, he's taking them from slavery to ruling. He's slaving them, taking them from something to something. And they have to have anticipation about that. So in that Passover meal, they're not just thankful that God is protecting them from the death angel, but they're thankful that he's getting ready to move with them, that he's calling them into something, something glorious, something powerful. So here they are moving from slavery in a place that's not their own into ruling as sons and daughters of God. How profound that is, how powerful that is. And that's our type for Yeshua, for Jesus. Again, his work on the cross wasn't just to save us from hell. It was to save us to him and to reigning and to dominion in the earth and the restoration of all that he has created. The month of Nisan is the month of new rule in that regard. Now, the month of Nisan came to be known as the new year for kings and festivals among God's people, and that's uh, the title that I chose this morning. But in addition to the fact that Nisan is the month that marks and resets the lunar calendar for remembering and observing God's appointed feasts and festivals, it also marks the annual years of reign by Hebrew kings. So in other words, when you look at the reigns of kings in scripture, uh, this king reigned 20 years, this king reigned five years, that marker is Nisan 1. That would mark the, the year of reign. That's how they did it. So that's key. Thus, it's not only a time to focus on revering the Lord and remembering his redemption, but it's also a time of focus on our ruling in him to further that redemption in the earth. Well, speaking of kings, since an assigned one marks the annual cycle for the reign of kings among God's people, does it not stand to reason that this is a type for signaling something much greater, much, much greater? the beginning of the reign of the king of kings. It's already biblically proven that the spring feasts and festivals all point to the coming Messiah and are fulfilled in Yeshua. Thus, it perfectly fits that Nisan 1 would mark the Messiah King's birth in the earth. Thus, Nisan 1 would be Jesus' birthday. Now, it's true that there's nowhere in Scripture where it point blank says, Nisan 1 is Jesus' birthday. That's true. But it's actually all over Scripture, Old and New Testament, that that's exactly when that happened. There are patriarchal prototypes in this. Extra-biblical Hebrew writings teach that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all born and all died during the month of Nisan. So again, that's not recorded in, in the Bible and Scripture, but it is recorded in, in Jewish tradition and Jewish history. And so the Jewish people hold that Abraham was born in Nisan and died in Nisan. Isaac and Jacob did the same thing. Well, that's a type. It's a prototype. We see in Colossians 1.18, he is the beginning. What does Nisan mean? Beginning, new. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He's first. Because we can be certain Yeshua was born in the spring. Now, the reason we can know for a fact he was born in the spring is he was born during lambing season. We know for a fact that lambs are only born in the springtime. And the only time that shepherds were out in the fields at night was during lambing season, during the spring. Why? Because they are watching over the ewes, and the ewes needed new grass for their milk, for their lambs. It was very important. There was a nutrient in that new grass that God created for them, and they had to have it. And so the shepherds would stay out in the fields with them so that the ewes could eat the new grass, but also they were with them to protect them from predators and also to help ewes who might have been in trouble in, in birthing. So that's why they're out in the fields at night. So the Bible tells us point blank that the shepherds were in the fields at night. And we can also know why were they there? Because it was lambing season. They were waiting for lamb to be born. Are y'all with me? 
It's also interesting that they were in Bethlehem and all the flocks around Bethlehem were used for temple sacrifice. That's what those flocks were for. A lamb born in Bethlehem would eventually be sacrificed in the temple if it was uh, worthy. Wow, okay. So we can be certain that Christ was born in lambing season. We can also know that his birth would begin the month that begins the spring festival season that points to him. He is indeed first in everything, isn't he? And let's look at this again, just to, to reinforce this. Christ entered Jerusalem on the day of the lamb, and that's when the lamb was brought into the house, and Christ went into the temple on this day. He was sacrificed on Passover, and we see that initiated there in Leviticus 23, 5. We were talking about that. So he entered Jerusalem on the day of the Lamb. He was sacrificed on Passover. He was resurrected on first fruits, and Holy Spirit was poured out on Shavuot, on weeks, on Pentecost. All right, we know this for a fact. This, this happened, and it happened in this order, and Yeshua fulfilled each one of these himself on the exact day, the exact time that the Hebrew people were observing them. Well, here's the deal. Yeshua had to be born before he could die. I think that's logical. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. You got to be born before you can die. Thus, his birth came first and fulfills God's reason. God's reason that Nisan 1 marks the shift in the new year of months. Well, of course, Christ would be born to set the calendar. He's everything. All things are created by him, through him, and for him. He is preeminent in everything. Of course, he sets the calendar. Of course, he sets the feast and festival system because it all points to him. And we can know for an absolute fact that he's already fulfilled, personally fulfilled, all of the spring feasts and festivals. Every observance in the spring has been complete. So it makes sense if he's going to die in this sign. Well, he had to have been born before all that happened. Well, would he be born on the second or third? Well, is Jesus second? Is he third? Is he fourth place? No, he's first. So we can see that God fulfills his pattern through his son. And remember, the very first command that God gave his people had to do with Nisan 1. What would Abba be about? What, what's dearest to his heart there? His son. And so that's the first commandment. Observe this day, set the new calendar. There's something very special, very important in it. You're going to eventually know why. So Nisan 1, 2022, which is the Hebrew year 5782. So the Jews counted as 5,782 years since creation, since Adam and Eve. <clears throat> so the Rosh Kodesh, which is the head of the beginning of the month for this year, is tomorrow. I think there's a song, tomorrow. tomorrow. It's tomorrow. As with all Hebrew days, the observance of it begins in the evening, 6 p.m., the day prior, which is today. So at 6 o'clock, remember we go to Genesis 1, evening and morning the first day. Hebrew people uh, recognize a new day with the evening before. So 6 p.m. begins that. Why? So why do they do that? Well, for God's people, a day begins with rest and then moves into work. Now, we're, we're Roman, we're Greco-Roman in our thinking. We start with work and think we got to work and then we get to rest, but that's not how God ordained it. God says, no, you rest first, evening and morning the first day. It starts with the evening. So it starts with rest and then you move into what God is doing and joining him in that. So that's why the observance of Nisan 1 begins tonight at 6 p.m., but the actual day, Nisan 1, is tomorrow. It's our April 2nd. Here's the thing. If you make the choice to track and observe what God has to say through his prophetic calendar, then you can know that he's moving his people into another spiritual transition that is working toward his fulfillment in the natural world. Thus, on Yeshua's birthday into the earth, the best birthday present you can offer him is your thanks and praise for what he came to accomplish, as well as your active willingness to go forward with him in fulfilling it. Now, it's not a salvific issue. If you don't think that Christ was born on this son one, uh, that doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. That's okay. If you want to be stuck on December 25th and go for that, it's not personal. 
Uh, on my heart and on my mind, I'm utterly convinced it's an Nissan one. I believe that tomorrow is Yeshua's birthday. He begins, his birth begins the shift in months, and he begins the observation of the feast and the festivals of God because they're all about him. But regardless of what you think about his birthday, uh, every day he's worthy of praise. And I would encourage you that in the morning, if, you, if, you, if this tracks with you at all, when you wake up, say, happy birthday, Yeshua. Happy birthday, Jesus. Honor him in that and say, hey, what are we doing this year? Where are we going? I'm going with you. You lead, I'll follow. Abba, Father, we thank you so much for your living word to us. How brilliant you are beyond our comprehension. Lord, the, the more we study into your word, the more amazed we become. Precision, absolute precision. In the chaos that we've created, you have precision in all that you do. Lord, we know for a fact that Nisan 1 is very important to you. It's the very first command that you gave your people as a whole. And Lord, I'm believing that the reason for that is that's Yeshua's birthday. That's the day that you ordained for your son, for God, Emmanuel, to come dwell with us on the earth. And Jesus, Yeshua, we praise you that you were willing to fulfill the meaning of those feasts and festivals, that you were willing to be the Lamb of God, that you were willing to go into Jerusalem, that you were willing to be the sacrifice. And we thank you, Abba, Father, and Holy Spirit, that your power proved mightier than death, hell, and the grave. Just as you defeated and embarrassed all of the gods of Egypt, you defeated death, hell, and the grave through Yeshua. And on first fruits, Lord, you emerged from that tomb victorious. And then, Lord, we see on the 50th day, Holy Spirit, you were poured out in the earth. But, Lord, we also see that as the idea of our redemption was revealed through that, the light of that was revealed in that time, the, the fulfillment of that is not complete in the earth. Lord, for those of us individually who have received your grace and said yes to you, yes, we are saved, and that is complete. But what's not complete, Lord, is the, the restoration of the earth and the restoration of your reign and your rule here. And we know that that points to the, the fall feast and festivals, that, that second coming. But right now, we're in process of bringing that about. And Lord, you know I'm no prophet, but I do believe, Lord, that you're saying there's something very special about Nisan this year. Lord, you've already shown us in your word that it's a time of miracles. It's a time of, of power, a time of judgment on evil rule. It's a time of expectancy, Lord. And so, Father, we track with your word. We track with you, Holy Spirit. And, Lord, we want to be ready. We want to have our sandals on. We want to have staff in our hand. Lord, we don't want to just thank you for being saved from something. We anticipate of being saved to something. We want to